The world of FM it is all about this ability to capture a signal and distinguish it and differentiate it from all the noise that's in the, in the environment. You don't see it, you don't hear it unless you're looking at a spectrum analyzer, but that noise field is increasing. Uh, there is talk of even doing an audit of the noise uh, field in the, uh, in the U.S. It is, uh, it is definitely an increasing phenomenon. So we have a lot more that you're competing with. It is going to get worse. Uh, to overcome this noise floor, you have to work a little smarter. Uh, you have to identify what you're competing with, uh, and unfortunately, unlike some scenarios where everything is very predictable, RF is not a static environment. Uh, every time somebody lights up a phone call, uh, every time uh, some new uh, service gets introduced and somebody starts to play with their portable device, there is an added complexity that's added to this, uh, this sea of, of RF signals that are, are existing in the universe. And when I use the term RF, if anybody is not familiar with that, we're talking radio frequency uh, signals at that point. So that's the noise that I'm talking about. We're not talking hiss here. We're talking competing RF signals that are competing for the attention of the wireless receiver and basically obscuring the signal that the RF receiver is trying to pick up. So how do you see this? Well, fortunately, there's some great tools. So both of these uh, gentlemen represent companies that have built tools into the receivers. Um, let me see a show of hands again. How many of you have actually used some of those tools in your radios to give you a spectrum analysis look? That's actually pretty good. Usually when I ask that question, not as many hands go up, so it's good to see that. Uh, you've paid for this, it's a good thing to use. If you don't have that in your, in your radios, there are devices like the one that's on the screen, that's a third party device, that's in the three or $400 range. Um, but the ability to actually look at the, at the spectrum, by spectrum I'm talking about the sea of frequencies out there, and see the activity, see what's going on. It is not as simple as determining, oh gee, where are the TV stations? Oh gee, where are the two-way radios? It's much more complex than that. And as I said, it's dynamic, it's changing. So you usually want to see what's going on when the services at your church are not going on, but you certainly want to see what happens when you fill the room with people who are wearing devices. When you uh, least want interference, that's usually when it shows up. How many of you have a third party RF spectrum analyzer? Anybody? Okay, that's pretty typical, but they're great tools. Uh, however you see it, whether you see it with your built-in radios or with the third party devices, if you're going to be running any sort of an operation where it's mission critical to have working wireless microphones, in the past you've been able to get along without them, in the future I think you're gonna need those. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of things today that maybe you aren't aware of, but these just fall into the category of things you probably aren't thinking of. When you saw the slide a few moments ago about all the other things that are in the RF spectrum, most of that stuff, cell phones and garage door openers and the baby monitors and all that stuff you've heard of. How many of you know that, that uh, interference comes from devices like uh, video walls? Out on the floor, you're gonna see a lot of companies with video walls. Some of those produce RF interference. Some produce a lot, some produce a little. There are some characteristics about them that seem to be uh, rather predictable. Some of those are noted here on the screen. Generally, it's very broadband. It is, uh, by that meaning, low frequencies and high frequencies. It is more intense at the low frequencies down in, in lower UHF and in VHF, but it's out there and it's substantial. It's very near field. The good news about that is it doesn't go long distances. It's coming from a lot of, of, of uh, elements within the screen. But what happens, unfortunately, is you put speakers usually right in front of those darn things. So now you've got to point your antenna at somebody who's standing right in front of a source of near field rather intense near field uh, competing radiation, you could have troubles. So it's something to be aware of. These are things where now you start to consider that when you get into how you point your antennas. If you're in the back of the room because that's where front of house is, you point the antenna at me, you have to be aware that you're also getting what's behind me. And if you put your antennas off to the side and aim them at me, you have a better chance of getting me and less of that. So it just goes into identify, you know, know your enemy, know where your interference is coming from, and use that as you're planning how you're gonna cover your event. A couple more terms real quick, frequency modulation, FM, all the microphones that we're talking about uh, today are uh, FM mic microphones. Uh, frequency modulation, it's very much like the FM radio band. Uh, deviation, that frequency that they print on the back of your wireless microphone, that's kind of the center. Uh, that's, not the, it's, that's not where it's confined to. Your signal is, is varying all around that. That's the deviation. How much that's shifting back and forth has to do with the intelligence that you're trying to put on that carrier wave. This is all about trying to get, in, in the case of, of this term, the word intelligence has to be your signal, and you're trying to use that to modulate this carrier. So it moves back and forth, and that uses more frequencies than just what's printed on your radio. So this issue of deviation creates a channel width. In the U.S., that is defined by law to not exceed 200 kilohertz as a maximum channel width. 
and that's a deviation of plus and minus 75 kilohertz on either side of this carrier frequency, which is the frequency that's printed on the back of your radio. So the reason I bring that up is, if you start to think of individual frequencies, that doesn't mean much, but if you start to think of this as a channel, that you're occupying a hunk of frequency, that starts to mean something. Now, when we talk about a hunk of channels, we start to think of this as building blocks and we can just stack them right next to each other. That isn't a really great idea. Uh, there's a lot of things about stacking them right next to each other that become problematic. And if you have used, and I should ask that question, how many of you are running more than eight microphones in your church simultaneously, wireless microphones? Are all those microphones critical to be mobile microphones? You noticed I ran a wire today. I'm gonna to wander around, so it's probably better that I'm on a wireless microphone. Those guys are sitting at a table. I've got them on a wired mic. I went to a church not too long ago. They said they were having trouble with their wireless mics. Could I come over and help them? They had eight wireless microphones. Unfortunately, they were the least expensive mics in the world. They weren't very good mics. I said, yeah, I'll come by and try and help. But the first thing I did was ask, why are there four microphones over there in the choir box? Why aren't those wired mics? It was just like, there's no other kind of microphone than wire, wireless microphones. Well, no. If you're going to use this uh, uh, precious resource, and it hasn't been precious in the past, but it's going to become precious, the spectrum is a, a precious commodity nowadays, use it intelligently. You know, in California, they don't leave the water running when they brush their teeth. In other places in the country where water is pretty plentiful, they do. As a resource starts to get more precious, you start to be careful how you use it. You want to use wireless microphones where you need them, when mobility really matters, and then use them wisely. But uh, you know, wireless microphones in the choir box, it's a stretch to me why that's necessary. Um, but as we get close together, as we do that situation or any other, if I had both of these gentlemen on wireless mics and they were sitting over there shoulder to shoulder, we have to be aware of the interaction of those wireless microphones. So this uh, term intermodulation products uh, comes up. You've probably heard this term. If you've ever, ever purchased a bunch of microphones from the same company, you've probably consulted a chart that says, here are our recommendations. If you're going to use eight microphones, here are the frequencies we recommend you use. Don't divert from those tables. Don't take that lightly. That stuff really matters. The way these things interact, you start to get to my, I probably have a chart on this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, well, this is very true. Uh, I always say avoid mixing systems from different manufacturers in the same band primarily from the standpoint that you start to mess up their predicted tables. If you have all Shure microphones or all Sennheiser microphones operating <laughs> the same band and you follow their directions on what frequencies can be used next to each other, you're golden. If you start to mix them up and start to get into different schemes, you could create some issues. What happens is, as we get two transmitters close to each other, we start to have not only the two frequencies that are involved in those two transmitters, but we have a sum and difference thing going on. So we could take a harmonic twice this frequency and subtract this frequency from it, and all of a sudden we find out that, well, that puts another carrier out here that's not too far from the other two. And now we do it the other way. We do the math two times these minus that one. So this is all part of how these microphones behave when they start getting close together. If you actually look at one microphone in a spectrum anal uh, analyzer, you see one blip. You look at two microphones, you start to see more than two blips. Those blips are the products, these intermodulation products of hey, twice this one minus that one, twice this one minus that one. And they start to show up, and they are just as much a source of interference and competing noise as if someone had another microphone there. How many of you have encountered situations where everything was fine until you started hooking up three or four mics close together? Has that occurred? If it hasn't caused you trouble, it's probably because you're following those manufacturer recommendations, and that's great. Continue to do that. The other things to do, though, um, just avoiding those really super close situations is a good thing. Uh, two people standing right next to each other, talking to each other, both holding their own wireless microphone. If they're three or four inches apart, you're going to create a lot of unnecessary trouble for yourself. Sometimes that's covered better with one guy with a microphone than two guys with their own microphones. Um, I should point out, too, at the bottom of this is newer mics are much better at reducing this. It hasn't gone away entirely, but some of the latest microphones are so good that they have uh, better linearity, so they produce less of this intermodulation product. Receivers can be confused by a lot of things that aren't radios. Uh, we usually think of interference as coming from TV stations and two-way radios and all those things, but a lot of consumer devices that are wireless use weight radio frequencies. So when you're identifying this noise field, when you're identifying what you're competing with in a source of competing signals, you're going to find a lot of stuff that's nearby that you wouldn't have thought of uh, as an obvious. Certainly the TV stations are an issue. I say they're strong signals from afar. Now, if they're right next door, they're not afar. But in general, you're dealing with strong signals that are megawatts of effective radiated power 
coming from transmitters that are very predictable. We know exactly where they are. You look out in the horizon, you can see those antennas. It's a good thing to keep in mind when you're aiming your directional antennas at your talent. If there's a big TV station on the other side of that wall out that way, I'd be better to not put a receiver on that side of the room going this way. I'd be better to go the other way. Everybody follow? Just identify what these competing sources of interference might be. The interference doesn't always have to be on your frequency. And this is something that not everybody is aware of as well. The way receivers work, it's almost like your ears in the room. At some point, there's a saturation that occurs with frequencies that aren't even on the frequency that the, the radio is trying to receive. Its ability to filter out all that stuff is finite. Uh, it does a great job at it. The new radios are very good. But if you have a really strong signal that's on a frequency that you're not using, if it's intense enough, we'll use the term swamp the receiver, but it actually desensitizes that receiver and makes it work very poorly. And I'll come back to that concept later when I explain something about preamps. So what happens when you get two frequencies on the same, or two signals on the same frequency? If you're listening to AM radio, you drive down the road, you might actually hear two stations. One's playing rock and roll, one's playing country music, you hear them at the same time. It doesn't work that way with FM. In FM, you drive down the road, you hear one station in one city, it starts to get weak, you go down into a valley, all of a sudden it's a talk show. Go back up the top of the hill, they're playing music again. It picks one or the other. It, it uh, uses a whole different scheme that basically uh, uh, is the strongest wins. Uh, it's a capture effect is what they call it. And uh, in that regard, the good news is you don't have to be a ton louder than the competition, but you have to be somewhat louder. If you think of all the people in the stadium and they're all wearing this, I, I come from Wisconsin, so we see a lot of green and gold on, on football games. But if there's one guy that's wearing bright orange, he sticks out. And if I were using that analogy in a radio situation, I'd go, yeah, okay. I can differentiate that guy. He's, he's, he's clearly what I want to find in everybody else's noise. The Packer fans would be very upset to hear me call him noise. But uh, on the other hand, if he's wearing a slightly different shade of green, not going to pick that up. So you want to be distinctly different than your competition. And we usually say that it takes about 3 dB to ensure that the capture effect will signal out your signal, allow you to differentiate the signal you want to pick up and successfully operate. The trouble is, without a spectrum analyzer, you oftentimes don't know how close you are to the point where it's just going to drop out. There's a lot of things like that now. If you've ever tuned in DTV stations, it's the same way. Everything's good until all of a sudden everything's bad. So everything you can do to maximize your difference from that noise field, that's golden. So we'll talk about a few ways to do that. So couldn't we just make the mic more powerful? Yes, that would differentiate you from the noise. It would make your signal stronger. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to go beyond the licensed 1 20th of a watt. Are any of you uh, using Part 74 authorized radios in your churches? Does anybody know what Part 74 is? I'll tell you very quickly. Part 74 is a different classification. It's a licensed wireless. You're, you're, for the most part, I suspect you're using unlicensed wireless microphones. They fit into the 1 20th of a watt category. There is a classification for licensed microphones. They can use a little more than that. They can use a quarter of a watt. They can also use some frequencies that are not allowed to be used by the unlicensed operators. The FCC has recently uh, reduced the threshold of, of uh, requirement for what it took to get to be a, a Type 74 authorized user. If you represent a megachurch, it's possible that your church would qualify. Generally, the factor is, are you regularly using 50 channels of microphones at a time? Large touring sound companies, entertainment venues, Las Vegas shows, yeah, they use 50 channels. Churches? Uh, a couple of years ago, I'd said, no chance. I've been to some churches where they use more than 50 channels, and they could, in fact, and they probably are, licensed 74 users. It does increase the frequencies you can use. It has a number of benefits. For the most part, though, I'll restrict what we talked about today to part 15, because it sounds like that's where most people are. So why are we so weak? Well, fundamentally, you have to understand the deck is stacked against you. The FCC didn't set this up to be a successful wireless microphone uh, operation. They set this up to be a place, I'm talking about the UHF band, for TV stations to exist. And then kind of as an afterthought, it was like, oh yeah, we can use these for wireless microphones. But the rules basically say that secondary services, and you guys are secondary services, must not create interference to primary services. The licensed broadcasters, the other people who are licensed for that spectrum, they're the primary services. But you're supposed to cope with whatever interference they generate that you encounter. And it's kind of lumpen. It's a little different if you're part 74, but if you're part 15, you're definitely in a Take what you get, but don't cause any trouble to your neighbor. On the basis of that, that means you have to operate pretty smart because you've got some signals you have to be able to differentiate yourself from. Here's a really good way to do that. This idea of 
making the transmitter stronger, we can't turn up the power at the transmitter legally, but we can increase the amount of signal that hits the receiver by simply getting closer. The way it works is the signal spreads out. It isn't a linear process. So as I get closer, if I'm trans transmitting from here to there, if I walk further away or I walk closer, I have a very dramatic impact on the signal strength. If I get twice as far away, I have one quarter of the signal strength. If I get half as close, if I move to here, I'm going to have four times the strength. Very easy way to maximize your signal to noise ratio is just to get closer. How can you get closer? The majority of the churches and facilities I go to have needlessly long throw distances between the receiver and the transmitter. My ability to walk around untethered with microphone cords doesn't mean I have to throw to the back of the room just because that's where the front of house mixer is. If I throw 20 feet to the side where a guy's got a wireless microphone, or even better, if they've got one built into the stage here, heck, that's 10 feet. What have I done to my signal strength? Well, it's through the roof. I'm not going to get competition from other signals that way. So look at your plant. Just because you've always done it that way or you got away with it, that's not necessarily the right way to do it. And definitely think three-dimensionally. A lot of times when you see a Las Vegas show or you see something and everybody's using wireless mics like they're never going to drop out and have any trouble, those antennas aren't very far away. And a lot of those antennas are optimized for operation in a three-dimensional environment. Most of your interference comes from the horizontal. The TV stations are out there, the cab radios, all that stuff are out here. What if I have an antenna here underneath me that I'm walking on on the stage or up there and it's aiming down and it's pretty good at knowing out to the sides? It's going to get a lot of me and not very much the competition. So as I say, these are just some ideas to kind of be thinking three-dimensionally. But this idea of as you get closer, it has a dramatic impact. Cutting it in half four times the strength. Quiet frequencies, yeah, there aren't going to be any more quiet frequencies. And the term I really hate the most is you've read a lot about white spaces. Gentlemen, are there really any white spaces? There haven't been any white spaces for a long time. The concept was TV stations here and here, and there's this big empty gap in between. In concept, that's sort of a white area. But it's not really, because there's intermodulation products among a lot of different services. That's filled up with a lot of stuff. So if you take a spectrum analyzer and look at, at the noise field, you don't see a flat line. You see a lot of stuff out there. So it's not white. It might be gray, but it's not white. But we do have a lot of services that are crammed into a tight space, and now it's about to get worse. Now this, this chart you're looking at, obviously you can't see the detail on it. This is the entire spectrum that the government is regulating. But basically, I just show you that to go, it's not like there's a lot of wild open spaces out there. Um, they've got all the stuff mapped out, and it's, for, it's everything from radio and TV and the things you know about to things like radio astronomy and stuff that you don't even think about, uh, radio direction finding and all this kind of stuff. They had to make home for all that stuff. But it's all been carved up. It's all been allocated. And it's about to get worse. Uh, currently, the wireless microphones fit into those frequencies that I'm describing there. That's primarily where wire wireless microphones go. Um, UHF is the most common. Those are the UHF TV channels, and you guys are operating between, you know, basically where the TV stations are not in your town. Um, and that's great, but unfortunately that's also great spectrum for the wireless companies to be focused on. They want frequencies to be able to let people look at, uh, you know, cat videos on their phone while they're waiting for the bus. Uh, all those things that are making iPhones and smartphones work really well require bandwidth, and the companies want more of it, and so there's a crunch going on. So we have a spectrum uh, they'll say a spectrum crisis. I don't know if it's a spectrum crisis, but we certainly have a spectrum battle going on. If we zoom in on just the part of the chart, this is just a, a snapshot of part of that chart that shows where the wireless microphones fit in. Those uh, blue spots there currently, that's yeah, brighter on my screen than there, but uh, those big blue spots, that's where the wireless microphones for the most part live. Uh, the most popular place for wireless microphones right now is in UHF. A long time ago, we used to have a lot of people in VHF. VHF has not been used so much lately. Um, and there are characteristics for these different bands. All bands are not created equal. They have different propagation. That term really refers to how the signal, how the signal behaves, how it passes through objects, how it, uh, how it is attenuated. And uh, because of that, certain frequencies are more desirable for wireless use than others. Here's a synopsis of that. I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but as we flash through this, you'll get an idea. The big thing I want you to come away with is, as we get into these different bands where, where wireless microphones could work, there's different characteristics. Uh, VHF is long wavelengths. That's just the physics of it. That means the antennas are generally long. Um, it becomes cumbersome. And uh, there are some things about VHF that are better. VHF goes longer distances on the same power uh, as UHF. So 
That could be a good thing. If I want a signal to go through a wall, VHF is a much better choice. Uh, sometimes I don't want the signal to go through a wall. If it's a school and I've got 10 classrooms in a row, I'm very happy to have those walls block those signals from the other classrooms. But it's something to be aware of. It's, uh, it's a little clunky because of the long wavelengths, but it actually is a very efficient way to operate in wireless microphones. In the old days, a lot of TV stations were in VHF. All those stations, or nearly all of them, moved up to UHF. And uh, now VHF is kind of not unused, but it's, it's kind of open. That may change as a result of some of the things I'm mentioning, but right now VHF is one of the areas that they're looking at as a place to park some wireless mics. UHF, where most of you are operating, is a very wide band. It's great because we've got a lot of frequencies to choose from. Generally, the sweet spot in wireless microphones uh, uh, has been in the 500, 600, 700 megahertz range. You had to get off of 700 megahertz a few years ago, and most everybody's operating in the 500 and 600 megahertz band, and we're going to take a look at that in more detail. But um, the characteristics to be aware of is that uh, walls block that a little more than they do in VHF, so natural obstacles are, are uh, better at shielding outside signals and keeping your signals from going places, but it also could be a hindrance to what you're trying to do. But it creates very compact devices, which when you think about mobility, that's pretty important. So kind of the sweet spot for not only wireless mics, but also for smartphones is up in UHF. What about higher? 900 megahertz and 1.9 also have some hunks of spectrum that are reserved for wireless microphones. Uh, even shorter antenna links, that's great because they become so short at that point that you're hardly even aware of them. Easy to build them into the body in the case of the wireless microphones. The slots of frequencies that have available are relatively narrow though compared to UHF. Not a great place if you have to use 10 or 12 channels of wireless microphones, can't be done. You can put a few channels in these areas, but the, the relative uh, space available there is much less than we've got in UHF. Currently less crowded. Uh, but that's, uh, that's changing all the time. A lot of other things are also going up into those frequencies. Uh, cable losses, very much greater. As frequencies get higher, the cable losses become greater. And this is the cable between the antenna and the receiver. So if you're going to remote antennas, and you're doing that at UHF or up at 2.4 gig or higher frequencies, be aware that the amount of loss in that cable is going to go up dramatically as we get into higher frequencies. Latency, uh, something Eric that tipped me off to, uh, at 1.9 gigahertz band, um, applications that require low latency, and by that I mean when I snap my fingers you hear it right away, you don't hear it later. So a guitar player that wants to use a wireless microphone wouldn't want to use a highly latent system. When he goes to pluck the string he wants to hear it right now, not later. Some of the technology is geared for successfully communicating, uh, like network communications. Network and email is not instantaneous. And at 1.9 gigahertz, you're dealing with a lot of that. There's built-in latency that you cannot get around. That's part of the definition of how that, that band works. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. I know it. Very good. Oh, the one before. I'll go back one. It's a good question, and we're going to let me set it aside for the moment because that's one of the things I want to talk about with my group here at the end. For the last 20 minutes, that's one of the things I want to talk about, but I'll say this. When you hear the word digital, um, people associate it with a 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, um, but it doesn't have to be. We have digital wireless in UHF, and we have the digital technology can be applied at, at all the different frequency bands that we're talking about. It's not unique to 2.4, but the characteristics that I'm talking about here are more characteristics having to do with that frequency of operation. But we will come back and talk to the topic of what do you get with digital and, and, and where is it appropriate and where is it maybe not appropriate. Would that help? In terms of operating in, in that frequency spectrum. And then I'll talk to that in more detail right now then. On this, on this uh, frequency spectrum, the things you're dealing with here is that they're relatively narrow bands available and you're sharing it with a lot of services. If, uh, if we look at the spectrum in any given event, like an expo that we have going on here, you're going to see a lot of users you're competing with. Uh, right now, you'd probably be very successful running a couple of channels. But if you and five other people want to run a couple of channels, we would have some difficulties pretty quickly. Um, at 2.4 gig, you're going to find people generally running very successful two-channel, three-channel operations. You're not going to find people trying to do more demanding applications. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Everything uses that same hunk of spectrum, and it's kind of the Wild West. At this moment, we've got a lot of devices that are operating in that same spectrum. So you can find yourself in a situation very quickly that, hey, it worked just fine before in the sound check, 
now the church is full of people and you've turned on your wireless router for the church and everybody's doing stuff and yeah, this is, this is a different spectrum. So definitely something to be aware of. But we'll come back and talk about that one more. Um, 2.4, extremely tiny. Uh, Bluetooth, all these other devices using very high frequencies. It's just you're dealing with the coming and going of consumers at that point. So you follow the situation. All of you folks could be potentially uh, uh, sources of interference simply by wearing some sort of a smart device or a, or a telephone or something. And we've created a lot more noise than I would have measured in this room before we began the presentation. So let's talk about the auction a little bit. I'm actually on time here. This is great. Um, this auction, I'm glad you have been following, because one of the messages I want to uh, impart is uh, subscribe to the blogs. Uh, both of these companies have done a great job of getting information out there. Go to their websites. Um, I subscribe to the, the blogs. You guys can read these things, too. Uh, uh, some of the magazines that do a great job, TV technology, and some of the ones that are focused on the broadcasters do a great job of this. But what's actually happening is, the, uh, uh, as you can see here, the auction originally targeted 126 megahertz. They wanted to take everything from channel uh, 29 and up in terms of TV channels and sell it off. And the concept is simply, all right, most of the stations live up there. We will first figure out what prices they need to get off of those channels and, and sort this out. Then we'll offer it to the phone companies and, and the people that want the spectrum. If we come up with a happy combination, we've got a sale. Then we're going to repark all those stations that were up there down below, minus any stations that agree to go off the air. I won't get into the complexities of that because there's a lot of options here. Stations can either share facilities or go off the air or choose none of the above. But ultimately, this is a two-stage process. We're going to first hear that, okay, we, had, we have a deal, which we do not have yet. And right now, they did not have a deal, and they missed it by a... <laughs> they didn't come up short. They came up like in a different uh, time zone. Uh, so they've started up again. Now the target is to clear less channels. Now it's channel 31, everything above channel 31, 114. Um, I am a little dubious whether that's going to be a winning combination either. I suspect there'll be another round after this, but we'll see. Um, at some point, though, they'll announce, okay, we have a deal. Now, here's the frequency. It's going to be 500 blah, 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 or it's going to be 600 something. Everything above that, get off of it. A, it isn't going to be immediate. You don't have to stop using it immediately, but I want to come back to that topic because that's also something that's not always well understood. Um, but you have another issue. The last time they did this, they took away 700 megahertz and everybody said, okay, stop using those radios, buy new ones, buy something down in 500 to 600 megahertz, you'll be fine. The reason this is different is, remember I said we're going to take all those TV stations and move them down, this repacking. How many of you watched a, uh, a representation of a hard drive being defragged? You saw all those scattered things, you know, and all of a sudden the little blips are all getting packed nice and tight down below. That's a good mental image of what's going to happen when they repack TV stations. You take all those TV stations that are operating above channel 31 and say, okay, you've got three years to get off of those channels. You're going to go down below. They're going to get packed in really tight in big cities. In New York City, wall to wall. The good news is uh, DTV stations can be parked wall to wall. Uh, but it also means that there's not going to be any white space. We're not going to have any UHF wireless microphone use between TV stations if they're all stacked tight. So this one's different. So that's the part to be aware of. Right now, we don't know exactly what the frequency range that's going to go away is. We, we've heard 126. That didn't turn out to be right. Now 114 megahertz. It might be less than that. But very likely, most of the 600 megahertz band will be off limits. What we don't know is what that's going to do to how crowded it is below that. So that's why this is not a great time to just suddenly just, oh, replace all my radios. So that's not what I'm advocating. Um, in detail, what that leaves right now, if they were successful with 114, and by successful meaning that the amount of money that the government and the FCC uh, and the TV stations want to be able to get rid of those frequencies and what the phone company is willing to pay actually mesh up, which they didn't happen last time, we'd be down to 18 channels for TV stations. In a city like Chicago or New York, that's barely going to get the job done. Um, again, some of them may go off the air, so it's changing. But that's why this is sort of a stay tuned. That's why I say read the blogs, see what's going on. I suspect by sometime this fall we'll have a clearer picture or early in 2017. I don't expect this to last until the end of 2017, but I could be wrong. We'll see. Visually, uh, that section there is the hunk that we're talking about. I I'm sorry, 2010 sale. That's what you lost when 700 megahertz went away. The red is what's at stake right now, roughly that's the 114 plan, and the blue to the left of it is what's left. So as you can see, you're going to end up with about a third 
of what you started with uh, a few years ago in UHF. It's going to get more tight, and it's going to be full of TV stations that you didn't have to deal with.